Hi, and welcome back to Grassroots Crypto, where I like to teach people about crypto. In this video, we're going to be talking about trade accounts. Specifically, we're going to be looking at what are trade accounts, why trade accounts, how they work, and then we'll be running through how to use them. If you're new here, don't forget to like and subscribe to see more in-depth videos on some of the new features of ThorChain, as well as the continuation of my tour of ThorChain with part three, which will be coming out once I've done all these spotlight in detail videos. As always, there's a lot to get through, so let's get started. Trade accounts, this new feature, what is it? Trade accounts will effectively enable, as it says here, more capital efficient trading and arbitration than synthetics. So it's designed to replace synthetics for what professional traders and ARBs do and be better at it, is in more capital efficient. You don't need as much capital to rebalance the pools and you'll save money on transaction fees. As it goes through here, ARB bots can arbitrage the pools faster with more capital efficiency than using synthetics. This is because synthetics adds or removes from one side of the pool, but not the other, causing the pool to move only half the distance in terms of price. So as an example, if we're doing a 100 rune to Bitcoin swap, it requires $200 worth of synthetic Bitcoin to be burned to correct the pool price. These trade accounts have twice the efficiency, so a $100 rune to Bitcoin swap would only require $100 from the trade account to correct the price. This allows arbitrages to quickly restore big deviations using less capital. Also, they're going to be paying less slip fees, which we'll have a look at in a minute. So let's have a look at how trade accounts work. And first we'll start with a deposit. So we'd have an arbitrager or professional trader, kind of the same users of synthetics now. They would go ahead and they would deposit Bitcoin into the ThorChain vault. And this then would be changed to a one-to-one -one representation of the Bitcoin that's sent in and then become a Bitcoin trade asset. So this is a different type of asset type. And this is different to synthetics because synthetics you need to swap you need to go through a double swap to change from an l1 to a synthetic asset whereas here it's a one-to-one -one representation e.g there's no slip fee incurred no swapping that happens it's a direct conversion then that goes to your trade account same here if you were to send through uh, ether native ethereum then the same thing would happen here and then you would have an ethereum trade asset um, I've just got the two use cases here. So it's kind of the same thing, it, depending on you know what they're trying to achieve, the arbitrage, the rebalancing pools, pro trader, they just want to hold that in order to swap assets to do professional trading to, to make money, as opposed to arbitrages, I guess, who are also profit seeking, but are looking to balance the pools, rebalance the pools. So anyway, we have a trade account and from within this trade account, you can do swapping like normal swapping. Specifically, you can swap trade assets to Rune and vice versa, and you can swap trade assets directly to trade assets. And this is really good for arbitrage or rebalancing the pools. Just a note regarding the trade account, a couple of things. So Rune and Synthetics cannot be added to this trade account. So when doing this, you're using native Rune and you'll be doing a Rune transfer in, obviously the Rune transfer out for the um, withdrawal fee. Then trade assets are subject to the normal swap and slip fees. So there's nothing different here. Um, and they also increase the clout score, which you talked about in the last video. Trade accounts use streaming swaps, just like any other you know, swaps. And trade assets cannot be swapped to or from L1s. And this is again, another difference from synthetics. They must be added and then go through the withdrawal process, which is the exact you know, opposite of the deposit process. The other thing with swapping is that when you swap with the trade asset, so you're swapping a, a one trade asset to another trade asset, the trade assets reside within the trade account. They never leave the trade account. It's not like synthetics where they're held in a person's wallet. They live literally inside of a trade module um, or a specific floor chain module. And the swapping is really an accounting change to move in and out of the pools. That way, when you, you're swapping, say, your Ethereum trade asset to your Bitcoin trade asset, there's no, there's no uh, transaction fee that occurs. Now, while technically, yes, there's a message deposit inbound transaction fee, there's no outbound like there is with synthetics. So therefore, it's much cheaper in that respect. And as we talked about before, compared to synthetics, there's no swap fees. So that makes, again, uh, cheaper 
than using synthetics because to, to, to mint or burn or e.g. to create trade assets or to withdraw trade assets. You're just paying for the inbound and the outbound transaction fee. Moving on to withdrawal, then obviously you would send, um, you send a message deposit, and we'll look at this in a minute, to withdraw the trade asset. And that trade asset is then swapped one to, from a one-to-one -one representation to the L1 asset that's been requested to be withdrawn. And then that is sent to the person's wallet. So whoever is doing the request. It's a very simple process. Simply you're getting your L1 asset swapped to a trade asset, doing whatever trading you want, and then you request a withdrawal of the trade asset, and then that is converted back to your L1 asset, um, back to your wallet. And once you have those trade assets, you're free to trade with them like you would any other asset, except it's going to be more capital efficient and cost you less than it would be if you're trading obviously with L1s, as well as trading with synthetics. I want to touch on security here because there is a security implication for this trade accounts. So trade accounts are not held within the liquidity pools and the combined pool and trade account, e.g. The, the, the layer one here asset, could exceed the total bonded. So let's try and explain what that means here with some pictures. And thank you to Sam for providing a picture I could um, nicely copy to make this picture. So before trade accounts, we would have just the liquidity pool and then the bond. And then essentially the, the bond needed to be more than the assets in the liquidity pool because the bond is providing the security for the pool. So what can happen is this trade account, these, these L1s need to be secured. And because they don't live inside of the liquidity pools, it could be the case where this is, is the asset value is more than what is here um, securing it. So essentially there's, there's insufficient security for the assets held within the, uh, the Asgard vault. So this has caused a change in the incentive pendulum where the calculation of the incentive pendulum now operates based on the L1 assets versus the bonds rather than solely on the pool depth versus the bonds, which is what we showed before. This ensures there's always space for arbitrages to exist in the network and to be able to arb the pools effectively versus since hitting the caps. Because with synths, there's always competition with savers. Because synthetics underpins savers, when you add with savers, it increases the, the, the synth utilization, but arbitrages do that as well. So this trade account then will replace synthetic utilization for ARBs to allow more room for savers and essentially not compete with savers in the same way. Anyway, so what's important out of this is, being point two, if the combined L1 asset value exceeds the total bonded value, the trade assets are sold or liquidated, reducing the liability to buy rune and are deposited into the bond module, e.g. increasing the security. So what that means is these trade assets that are owned by individual people are going to be sold for rune and that rune is going to be placed into the, the bond module here to, to boost the active node bond. In this scenario, if this were to happen, the trade account might be subject to negative interest rates. This safeguard effectively redistributes liquidity from all the trade account holders to active node operators and will only occur if the incentive pendulum reaches a fully unbonded state. So unbonded being an unsafe state, that is where there is insufficient bonded liquidity to secure the pools or now more specifically to secure the L1 assets held within the Asgard vault. So let's have a look at how to use these trade accounts. In order to do the deposit, you would send your L1 asset to the inbound address with a specific memo. And here's an example. You'll use this trade plus memo and then you would need to add a Thor chain address. And this is gonna be the owner address. And it's very important that you own and control this address. As I said before, the L1 asset is then converted one-to-one -to, -one to a trade asset, and then we'll update the trade account balance. And we'll, we'll look at how to have a look at that in a moment. As I said before, the owner's Thorchain address must be specified. It's very important. In order to swap, you're gonna be utilizing the existing swap memo, and there's no real change. It's just gonna be your, you're using a different asset notation here. I open up this one 
you can read all about it, uh, the different asset notations here, and then trade accounts have been added. Anyway, so you would say, this is the trade asset I wanna to swap to. If, if I'm sending in rune, say swap from rune, you're gonna be saying here, swap to, um, to ether, and then this is the own address you're utilizing. So this is the trade account address to be for the Ethereum trade asset to be deposited into. So on and so forth. Uh, the, the main thing here is that the destination receiving address of the trade asset must be a ThorChain address because this is the trade account address that the requested trade asset is gonna be deposited into. As with the swap memo, you can use streaming swaps, you can use affiliates, you can do all that type of thing as well. In order to withdraw from the trade account, you would use this memo, this trade minus, as well as an L1 address that you want the asset to be withdrawn to. So it's the big, in, in our example, it's the Bitcoin address that you want this to be deposited to, your, your actual um, Bitcoin wallet address. This is an example of a withdrawal of 0.1 Bitcoin because we have the trade asset here, Bitcoin, and the amount is going to be 0.1 because this number divide 188 gives you 0.1. So what we're saying here is take 0.1 Bitcoin from the trade asset and deposit it to or send it to this particular address and it will do a one-to-one -one conversion of that. This is done through a message deposit to ThorChain. This is a message deposit construct and that would have the native ThorChain cost. To verify the balance of your trade account, you can use the trade slash account endpoint and then that would give you the balance for this particular own address. So you put your own address in here. So as you can see, we this trade account as an example has some Bitcoin and this is the um, asset amount here. And then we also have some um, Ethereum trade asset with this particular amount here. And then obviously the own address would match the own address put in there. So as of recording, trade accounts have not yet been enabled. If you go to, um, there's a nice uh, Constance and Mimir page here. This is the, the Mimir value, because that was also the constant value that enables and disables uh, trade accounts. And having a look today, um, it's not currently Mimir, which means it's not flagged on. However, I do know that all the testing is done in StageNet. There's just, you know, it should be any day, hopefully, that uh, trade accounts gets turned on. For more information on trade accounts, you can read the docs here. You can have a look at the original um, feature as well as some implementation detail. And there's a bit of a hint on limit orders because limit orders will use trade accounts under the hood as well as have a look at the code changes that were done for this particular uh, feature. So this is the merge request. You can go ahead and look at all the code changes there if you wish. Well, I hope you found this video useful. If you did, hit the thumbs up. If you have any questions on trade accounts, put them in the comment section below. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos like this. And the next video I'll be doing is on memoless transactions. So stay tuned for that. Until next time, thanks for watching. Bye.